GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that blockchain is going to change the world. That's why I'm carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. Today on the show, we've got Dan Schmieren, the founder and president of Metaversal, a $50 million venture-backed Web3 native company that is incubating, producing, and curating the next generation of culture while unlocking the vast potential of blockchain, the metaverse, Web3, the whole thing. To date, they've invested in 15 essential Web3 businesses and acquired a collection of over 2,000 NFTs. And Dan's going to tell us at the end what the one NFT is that he'll never sell. Now, Dan has got an incredible range of experience to bring to this conversation. Started off his career working at the White House, the U.S. Treasury, spent time in the State Department, and was part of the economic meltdown in 2008 when he spearheaded the unprecedented $30 billion initiative that was developed in response to that economic crisis. He's also spent time at a leading fine art and collectible warehousing storage. If you're in Web3, you could probably think about the application for fine art storage and blockchain verification and display of your items. And he also spent some time at a more traditional mutual fund, understanding the groundworks of investing and investing billions of dollars in a value-oriented investment firm. So Dan's got this incredible experience, and today we're going to talk about so many different things. We're going to start with Dan's experience and what led him to Web3 and the beliefs he has in Web3. We're going to talk about Dan's brother, who is the Web3 skeptic, and what Dan is doing to onboard Dan's brother, and also what he's doing to onboard more people to Web3 across the space. We're going to talk about data and really Dan's belief around ownership and control of data what Web3 enables. And I think a lot of us know that already. So we touch on that, but then we jump even further into where does this go when our data is on chain? What will be private? What will be public? Will we be able to opt in? Will we opt out? What is going to be a world for brands that can interact with us when they can see so much more of our data on chain? How is that going to lead to a better user experience and an experience where we actually have control, unlike now, where we don't have control over our data. It's just owned by a couple major Web2 tech companies. And then we're also going to talk about a few projects that Dan is really excited about that he's invested in in the past few months. One around a proof of achievement protocol that they're building, and another around Bitcoin ordinals and a project there. So buckle up. We've got a great show for you today. Thanks so much for joining us. It's going to be a blast. Before we jump in, we're just going to take a minute to hear from our sponsors. The future of social media is here, and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators, and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we partner with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. What if I told you that industry pioneers from flagship Web3 brands such as Consensus, Polygon, Binance, Unstoppable Domains, Ledger, and Uniswap will all meet up in one place 
this summer. You don't want to miss this. I'm talking about the epic Web3 conference taking place in beautiful Lisbon on the 9th of June with over 20 curated talks, speed consultations with Web3 experts, networking sessions with investors, and even the opportunity to raise funds. This conference has it all and you'll get the tools you need to succeed in this industry. Plus, we at Web3 Academy will attend and host a community meetup with you and the others from our community before the main event. So come along, meet us, network, and start building alongside leading Web3 innovators. We can't wait to meet you. Remember, Lisbon, Portugal, 9th of June. We've got a 15% discount for you, but ticket prices go up every few days. So get your tickets today by using the link in the show notes. Enter the promo code Web3Academy15 to secure your spot. Or if you become a pro member, you can get an even bigger discount. So go pro today. And we'll see you in Lisbon, Portugal, the 9th of June at the Epic Web3 Conference. Dan, what's up? Welcome to the show. So excited to have you here. What's up, Jay? Thanks for having me. I've been a fan of Metaverso for a while now. Subscribe to the newsletter, listen to the Go to Metaverse podcast with your business partner. But before we jump into Metaverso and Web3, I want to hit pause and go back to the beginning of Dan Sherman's career because You've had quite an interesting career, which I think really brought you to this point in Web3. And I want to kind of retrace the steps so we can understand what you've seen along the way and what lessons you've learned that has led you to really believe in blockchain and the ownership and control of data that Web3 allows. So let's start back in 2008, or maybe you want to go further back than that, when you're working at the US Treasury and the economic collapse happens. What was that like being part of that? And what lessons did you take from that? Yeah, so chapter one was me back in the swamp. I uh, spent eight years in Washington and I bounced around between the treasury, as you say, the State Department and the White House. Those were three areas that were of keen interest to me. And all of my roles had to do with the intersection of economic policy and national security policy. So I was very much exposed to issues like counterterrorism finance in 2004 and five, as we were hot on the trail of the bad guys, and then targeted sanctions programs as we were concerned about rogue states. And by 2008, I ended up inside the treasury building for what I thought would be a nice sleepy end to my Washington <laughs> experience. And little did I know I was stepping into this complete firestorm. And I ended up spending just shy of three years working on a handful of the rescue programs, including this public-private investment program. Every good government rescue program needs an acronym. So the one we worked on was called PPIP, focused on legacy securities. And that was really the toxic assets, mm -hmm. the commercial and residential mortgage-backed security markets that had completely frozen. Those were the assets that were clogging bank balance sheets. That was what TARP was designed to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Paulson team actually didn't have enough time to implement those components of the rescue program. And so they went with direct capital injections to major financial institutions. But when the Geithner team came in, they wanted to address the fundamental issue since things had started to stabilize. Mm -hmm. And I got to work on that. And so the takeaway from that first chapter was very straightforward. The system we had and the system we have is far from perfect. There are plenty of fault lines built into the formal financial system. And if 2008 wasn't concerning enough, we have that resurfacing in 2023 because all of a sudden a spotlight is shining on the very banks that you and I do business with, this idea around uninsured deposits. What do you mean my deposits may not be safe? I'm aware that there was a $250,000 limit. And for most people, that is plenty of headroom, mm -hmm. but not for small businesses. Mm -hmm. Small businesses aren't keeping the excess cash above 250000 that they require to operate under the counter and dishing it out as they need. They keep plenty of money in these institutions. And often they rely on their local or regional banks, not just the big money center guys, not just JPM and City mm -hmm. Wells and others. So those were some of the takeaways and part of what had inspired me to at least have an open mind to mm -hmm. what alternatives 
might exist. And the alternatives should ease some of the pain points when we look at financial transactions. And you've also spent time at UOVO, I believe Uovo. that's how you pronounce it, UOVO, yep. which is quite different. So you've really jumped around here, Dan. It's amazing your background. They're a leading fine art institution storage of collectibles. So you kind of got into the collectible art space as well. And then you also served as a director of investment at a leading fund, a capital investment fund. So so any... second chapter, yeah, second chapter yeah. of my career was working at uh, a more traditional investment firm. It was really a mutual fund manager. So think about your retirement accounts. We were a value-oriented manager. So if you think about style boxes, people want to invest in growth or people prefer value, those that are Buffett acolytes mm -hmm. and like Uncle Warren and Charlie, uh, style of investing, slow and steady. Mm -hmm. That was a big part of the thesis behind the investment firm that I worked for. And we had a very concentrated portfolio, usually no more than uh, 15 names. So we really got a chance to know those businesses upside down and as well as one could behind management. I really enjoyed that process. I love the research and became really interested in operating businesses. Mm -hmm. And so that's what inspired me after eight years of, of doing that to explore opportunities where I could really roll up my sleeves, get under the hood of niche businesses. And Wovo is one such example. And there are a number that are in that category, but they're not well known. And I say that because most people don't think about where all the fine art, fashion, and collectibles reside. They may assume it's in museums. They may assume it's in galleries or even in people's homes, religious institutions, colleges, and universities. All these categories have ownership over enormous amounts of these cultural treasures, and yet... 94% of them are out of sight. 94% of them are actually in secure storage, effectively <laughs> behind bars. So I found that fascinating. I was asked to come and help lead this particular business and find ways to grow what was a New York-based operation into a national player. And there were really two schools of thought. One is, how do you physically grow this business? And that was largely self-explanatory. But the more compelling part from my vantage point was around digital activation. How do I take Jay's collection of incredible sculptures over incredible oil works and begin to unleash mm -hmm. the stories that are embedded in those treasures? And the idea around digital activation to me was Jay is paying an enormous expense every year, I called it a negative yield, by virtue of maintaining that incredible collection. This is true for major museums as well, just keeping their items in storage. There's insurance expense, conservation expense, certainly logistics and transport if they end up participating in shows, and then there's the storage expense itself. And those are expenses that they have to foot the bill for, rain or shine. Mm-hmm. Those institutions have mandates, a mission to educate, to inspire, to grow awareness. And they're trying to fulfill that mission usually by showing less than 10% of their outstanding collection. Really? But what happens on my 42nd day in the seat at Wovo when pandemic is declared? Those museums close their doors. Those galleries are no longer open you are displaying 0% of your collection on the 43rd day. And so that idea around digital activation was front and center. And that is what was causing me to call some of my friends at CoinFund and ask them to ideate with me. And my initial thought bubble was simply, is there a mechanism for me to alleviate some of the costs that Jay, in my hypothetical, is bearing as the owner of these tremendous collections. And the same is true for museums, cultural institutions, mm -hmm. galleries. How do you alleviate part of that burden? That would be a huge mm -hmm. win if they could maintain ownership, continue to have these incredible pieces in their collections, but not be subject to the annual expense, which can certainly add up. 
insurance never goes down. I've never seen insurance break like, down. They only go in one direction. That's why, that's why Buffett loves it so much. <laughs> so that was sort of the formative. I've taken you through the different chapters of what led me to put those pieces together as it pertains to Web3 and NFTs. The same crew at CoinFund that I called in late 19 and early 20 were some of, the, some of those partners were the ones that had introduced me in earnest to crypto in 2015, 2016. So inevitably, when you're talking about a new ecosystem, I prefer to call people I know and trust. And in this case, mm -hmm. these are some folks that I went to college with. So I've known them for a very long time. And I know that the information that they're going to share is legit. I don't have to worry about wading through a lot of the nonsense. There's Understood. a lot of nonsense in this space, unfortunately. unfortunately. As there is in any new tech space, there's when there's opportunity, there's going to be scammers, but we won't go down that, that rabbit hole right now. So take us to the next chapter, which is metaversal. Was there a, a light bulb moment when you were like, yeah, this is what I want to spend the next chapter of my career doing? Or was it just all these friends, too many smart people, and you were like, I got to get on board and get on this ship before it's too late? It's definitely the former. You heard me say that I was really interested in operating companies, and I was mm -hmm. particularly interested in the structure of holding companies mm -hmm. akin to a Berkshire, akin to a Lucadia National, or even a small business in Florida called Heiko, which is not so small anymore. They all created structures which give them enormous flexibility. In our space, in the Web3 space, DCG is a representative example, what Barry Silbert created in a flexible holding company that has media assets, that has investment assets in the form of Grayscale, and at one point Genesis, and then a portfolio of other discretionary investments. And along the way, they're looking to solve tangible problems in the ecosystem. And so that was greatly appealing to me. What started out as my interest in solving for this digital activation question quickly expanded to, there's going to be an enormous amount of Web3 native intellectual property that's developed in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. Here I was sitting in a warehouse with all of the Web1 intellectual property yeah. or Web0 intellectual or Web zero. property, yeah. depending yeah. on how far back that sculpture goes. And it arises great interest in people because irrespective of your specific area of focus, there's something for everyone. I often say to my kids, you know, everyone's a collector. I used mm -hmm. to collect baseball cards and matchbox cars. My brother had little action figures. He preferred Jets memorabilia because he's a, a lifelong suffering Jets fan. So all of us have these particular interests. Collecting is a parcel of what we do, yet our ability to reach Others who share those similar interests historically has been challenging. Yes, you can go to the stamp fair and the baseball card trading expo. But you're not really reaching large swaths of humanity. You're reaching people that are in geographic proximity. In studying what was happening in this ecosystem and having dabbled with some of the blockchain technology in the years prior to 2020, eventually the light bulb went off that what we were talking about specific to fine art, fashion, and collectibles was really just the tip of the iceberg, that this was going to be an entree to an enormous unlocking, the tokenization of all illiquid assets, bringing things that we encounter in the physical world, real estate, automobiles, art and collectibles, you name it. And finding ways for that to be tokenized in many respects becomes the great equalizer, a great mm -hmm. force for democratization. You think about KKR tokenizing their healthcare fund, which they recently announced. Private equity has historically been the province of the already wealthy. The average Joe on Main Street can't access it, mm -hmm. usually doesn't know a ton about it, and yet doesn't benefit from the long-term attractive returns that the Yale Endowment and many other institutions, pensions, retirement plans, and high net worth individuals have enjoyed. Tokenization is not only going to allow for greater liquidity in those types of vehicles, but it also opens a door for greater access. So those are all things that 
were front and center for me. And again, partly inspired by the experience going back to my days in Washington. How do you reduce frictional costs? And how do you begin to level the playing field? Because this was a time, you may recall, when the big banks were culpable for a lot of misdeeds, a lot of wrongdoing. And uh, some of it was macroeconomic. So it was a facet of the environment they were operating in. And some of it was just unfortunate wrongdoing where you had you know, rejections from opening accounts to getting access to home mortgage loans, so on and so forth, right? That, that history has all been detailed. But again, it came back to this idea that there may be a better way, even if it's not a 100% solution. For those that don't have the same types of access that you may have or that I may have, right? We often take for granted, we go down to our mailbox and it's filled with flyers, filled with credit card offers. That is not the rule. That is the exception. At least in America, most Americans aren't getting those offers. They don't have the credit score. And credit score, which has been such a driver, such a determinant of your access to the formal financial system, hasn't really been updated in terms of its metrics in a long, long time. There are other factors which we all now are aware of which should be brought to the table. And there are some companies which are now taking a more expansive approach to Jay's credit worthiness. <laughs> but we know that by and large, they look at that one number. And if it's below a certain threshold, you're not getting that car today. You mentioned so many use cases for blockchain and Web3 there. I just want to highlight the collectibles one for a second. Because I think that collectibles is easy for people to understand in physical items, but difficult for people to understand in digital items because we have this copy-paste world where digital items up until now have been so easy to replicate. And well, what do you mean you own that? I can just screenshot it or copy-paste and it's mine too. Who cares, right? I'm curious, you use your brother a lot as an example of a normie. And your brother, as you said, collects. He, I think you say he collects baseball cards or something like that. Is that a use case you can explain to him? Does he, can he wrap his head around digital collectibles yet? It's still a struggle, right? We just had dinner last week, but I'll give you an example that I use with him. And it dates back to the time I spent in the art warehouse storage business. So what I found very surprising is that some of the wealthiest people in the country that own some of these incredible masterpieces don't necessarily display them in any of their homes. Mm. They display replicas and they are high quality replicas. Now this isn't universal, but I saw enough examples of this to resonate. And you'd say, well, why is that? If Jay just bought a $50 million Basquiat or a hundred and fifty million dollar Basquiat. What do you mean he's not going to put that on the wall? I mean, he needs to enjoy that piece. That's why he bought it, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Okay, he may have bought it for investment purposes, in which case a lot of this art stays in secure storage. But he may want to enjoy it personally, and he would love to have it in his apartment in New York. There's just one problem. Grandma upstairs has a leaky bathtub. And Jay's not willing to risk it because he's had a flood before. So let's think about that tangible use case. Jay owns this incredible work. He wants to enjoy it. There's only one of them. And when we go to his house for dinner, because he so generously invites us, we look at that art on the wall and say, what an amazing buy. I read all about it at the Sotheby's auction. Congrats to you. Not for one second would we think that that piece on the wall could be a replica I know Jay owns it, but he is showing us a fake. He is showing us the replica. And in my house, I may have a poster, a less high quality replica of the same work because I'm Jay's friend. I loved it. I was with him at the auction. And this is my way of remembering and celebrating that moment. And when I see the work, even if it's on my wall, it still brings me pleasure, still brings me a smile and some happiness. There's nothing wrong with that. So the question I pose to my brother is, why is it okay 
for us to have posters of Andy Warhol's Marilyn all over the place. That is, in essence, the right-click save for the real Marilyn work. No one says, I can't have a poster. The Warhol Foundation sells the posters. They're encouraging it because it's part of getting Andy's work out to more and more people. And they've been incredibly effective in doing that. So it comes down to property ownership. In the physical context for which our cohort knows so well, that's where we have operated, physical ownership is sacrosanct. Given how much time we spend crossing the T's, dotting the I's, if we go to buy a piece of property, it's not a one-page document. It's usually a binder. You go to lease or purchase a car. I've never seen a one-pager when I walk out of the dealership. These days, they give you a thumb drive, and it's got 20 different documents, including lemon laws, that you need to be aware of. So we take great pains to define our physical ownership because there is scarcity. And we always assumed that in the digital arena, because there's digital abundance, there can be no such thing as digital scarcity. That now has changed. There is an opportunity to have unique digital ownership over all sorts of goods and not just collectibles, even though that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You get me excited in so many ways, Dan. So I appreciate your energy while we're talking about ownership. I want to steer into ownership of data because data is one of the biggest parts of the web now is that we have we don't have a ton of big companies. We actually have a few very big companies that have easy access to our most sensitive data. They know exactly what we do, where we go, what we buy, where we search, and they have a persona built on us. They've built an entire identity of us, and then they carefully use it to monetize and to sell us things. And I think we're all aware of that world. I hope we're all aware of that. That's Use is a nice verb, okay? Exploit yeah, would be a better verb. There you go. There you go. So what does Web3 do differently with ownership and control of data? And not just what does it do, because we talk about that. We've talked about it on the podcast. I'm curious, what does that look like in the future? Like push us into the future. I don't know if there's any projects you're involved with that are looking at this. Where do we go with data, assuming we all get on chain one day? What does that look like? So, you know, you bring up an amazing point. You say that most people are aware. I would challenge you and say that okay. if they are aware, they're not really caring yet. They don't most care. Americans are agnostic, right? Mm -hmm. This is a grand bargain, which we have clicked into wittingly or unwittingly. I get free search. Google gets everything about me. They give me free Gmail. They can essentially see all the emails. I get a Google Drive account, my life's documents, my Google photos, all of those items. Again, we go back to the physical ownership context. I used to physically own those things on a floppy disk. I used to take it around with me, put it in my pocket, guard it. We keep it in a safe. Time progressed. We had external hard drives. Same idea as floppy, a little bit more reliable. And then you move to the cloud. And somewhere along the way, we say, well, this is just so easy. I mean, I can access it from anywhere. I don't have to carry this orange external hard drive around with me. That's clunky. And yet, does Jay really have ownership over his prized data? And by prized, I mean your financial documents, your personal email documents, right. medical or communication of any manner of that's personal yeah. and private to you that if you're given the option, hey, I would like this on the front page of the Washington Post, most of us would say, hell no, yeah. right? <laughs> that's not appropriate. This belongs to me. And yet it doesn't really belong to us. We mm -hmm. are renters today. Mm -hmm. So long as I pay Google a monthly fee, I can continue to access their service. And granted, I'm paying them because I use more of the gigabytes. If you're a very light user, maybe you qualify for free service, but increasingly they have created tiers that push us into a fee-based arrangement. 
And that's true with Amazon too. The beauty of Amazon, it's not just that I get something for free and they get the data. These companies are so smart that they actually get us to pay them to take all our data. I just told you I'm paying Google, so are many others. We pay Amazon to be prime members and in return, they have given us the ease of delivery and ordering online, which has been an incredible innovation. Mm -hmm. And yet all of that purchasing data, all of the browsing data, all of that machine learning that's built into Amazon's recommendation engines, hey, Dan, if you like these types of swimming shorts, you may like this other type of swimming gear, okay? We as consumers, in theory, benefit because they're making our lives easier. Easier. And that's the grand bargain to this point. But Jay hasn't had an opportunity to actually own or control any of his own data. That's now changing. For the first time, because of blockchain, this is the promise embedded in Web3, is that we can take back some of that control. We can decide which aspects of your private data you are willing to share. And if you do, for what type of cost? Mm -hmm. What type of benefit? There's other data you may never be willing to share. And you'd like to keep that squirreled away, out of sight and out of mind. We can dive down into this. But that, to me, is the big unlock around digital ownership and the idea of control. And in fact, you mentioned this very notion of control. Our team is working on an exciting project right now based around Bitcoin ordinals. And I won't go mm -hmm. down the rabbit hole because that can be an episode unto itself, other than to say it is not only innovative, but it's playing directly on this notion of who has control and why has it always been that control is subsumed by the biggest entities in society at the expense of the little guy. Mm. It's been very hard to challenge that equation until recently. I've got to ask, so let's go down the rabbit hole for a second here. Do you think Bitcoin is going to become a smart contract blockchain? And do you see that as a future or is this just a moment in time? Part of that outcome is going to be determined by the Bitcoin community, yeah. okay, of which there are strong opposing views today, <laughs> right? You had a longstanding group of Bitcoin maxis who see it as a store of value and aren't interested in seeing it in something beyond that. And they're entitled to that view. But you also have continuous innovation, which is part of what we love about this space, to the point where some developers were able to figure out a methodology mm -hmm. for breaking down these sats, satoshis, component parts, I should say, in layman's term, that underlie an individual Bitcoin token and in which we can now inscribe certain things, including art. Mm -hmm. which is what our team is working on in a mm -hmm. unique and innovative way. We still believe, I still certainly believe, that the ETH ecosystem, the Ethereum ecosystem, is going to be the dominant smart contract force. And I say that based in part by the scale of adoption by major institutions, mm -hmm. right? We can't be confused by the double speak. This is another point I often raised with my brother. On the one hand, you have Jamie Dimon out there saying that blockchain and all things associated with this ecosystem must be evil. They are <laughs> the embodiment of evil. And yet JP Morgan has an enormous blockchain team yeah. and has been one of the leaders in adopting blockchain tools for their own business and that of so many of their partners. So there's a little bit of a disconnect and it could be because there's nuance mm -hmm. in what leaders say and what the mainstream media picks up. Same thing with Larry Fink at BlackRock for the longest time saying crypto is for pirates. It's like mm -hmm. pirates bounty. And yet in his recent letter to investors, he's heralding the opportunity that blockchain yields for securities markets and so many financial instruments, which will now be more accessible with less frictional cost. Yeah, he's right. Yeah. They're both right in what they're doing, what their companies are doing, maybe less right about 
what they say or how they say it. Mm -hmm. yeah, we recorded an episode a few weeks ago where we talked about, will Bitcoin become a smart contract blockchain and what does that do to Ethereum? And exactly what you said, Ethereum's got a seven-year head start. They've got a massive network advantage of all of the apps and layer twos and even layer threes that are being built on top of it. It would take Bitcoin a long time to catch up, not to mention the energy consumption of Bitcoin versus proof of stake on Ethereum now, where there's certain countries that wouldn't even be able to adopt Bitcoin if it was a smart contract platform. Go back and listen to that show if you haven't already, if you want to dive down the should Bitcoin go smart contract path. Coming back to data and ownership, I'm going to tee you up with a few different questions. You don't have to pick them all. Take which one you want. You mentioned monetization of data. I think that's very interesting. Will we be able to sell our data? What does that look like? Have you actually seen any projects doing that? We had Brave Browser on. That's probably the only example I can think of so far, but maybe you know of some others. That's one. Micro personalization. I've heard you talk about this on some other podcasts you've been on. I think that's fascinating when we all have ownership and control of our data, but we allow access to it to brands and we bring our own wallet. I love that term, bring your own wallet. That's what we'll do in the future. What is micro personalization going to look like You know, when you check into a hotel or jump on an American Airlines flight? What does that look like? Or third point, sorry for throwing this all at once, Dan, general consumer engagement. How does consumer engagement change? And maybe this ties into micro personalization, to be honest, when we have all of our data on chain. Again, don't have to do them all. So let's Jeez. let's tackle them maybe in reverse order. So okay. what's the big conundrum for most brands that are out there? The conundrum isn't just gaining attention. It's actually retention. Mm -hmm. I can figure out various ways to get in front of Jay. How do I get him to stay? How do I get him to be loyal to my brand? Mm -hmm. We were just down in Austin, Texas around consensus. Mm -hmm. One of the themes we heard from big brands, Anheuser-Busch on down, is that they need help in three areas. They want to improve retention, which I just mentioned. They want to decrease customer acquisition costs, and they want to increase customer lifetime value. If you can help them with those three things, they will listen mm. and they will adopt it. Web3 has a unique opportunity in those three areas because what's the marginal acquisition cost for the next person via the web? It's very, very low, very, very low, particularly if it's built around communities that Jay becomes an ambassador. He becomes an evangelist for Dan's brand. And he's out there scooping up his friends. He's wearing the merch. You're wearing the Moonbirds merch right now. You're an ambassador for Moonbirds, whether you know it or not. That has really interesting implications around how brands start to interact with those individuals. It reminds me of years ago on college campus, a foreign auto manufacturer tapped my brother to be a campus ambassador. <laughs> and what that meant is that they gave him one of their little mini sedans and he got to drive it around school, show it off to friends, all of which was working perfectly until a car collided with him in West Philadelphia in their eighth or ninth week and the project came to an abrupt end. <laughs> for my part, I remember walking down the main drag of college campus for a company called Big Words. And this is at a time before Amazon had really established itself and Big Words was selling textbooks online. It was an e-commerce solution for textbooks. Because if you went to the campus bookstore, each textbook was $150, $200. Why is that? Yes, it's hardbound. Why can't it be $40? And so after you use it for one semester, you have no need for that chemistry book again. Big words would allow for you to basically recycle those books, get a portion of your proceeds back, sell it to the next person. So it's environmentally friendly and lower in cost. And they had these one-piece jumpsuits that I used to wear. So I was an ambassador, an evangelist for it, and I got benefits from it. So you right. take that same mental model and fast forward to today. How do you become an ambassador for a particular? How do you help brands target you in really precise ways that you find beneficial, not onerous? 
you're opting in. Today, we don't opt in. We always have to opt out, right? So I like to turn things on their head and invert. Rather than having to opt out, how about you have me opt in? Well, the reason for that is typically user adoption, user engagement is very low. So they'd rather say, hey, Jay, we'll give it to you. You tell us if you don't want it. But many times that actually turns off the customer. I think that one of the key ways to actually improve retention is you demonstrate real value beyond that initial sale and beyond the point of sale because you speak to areas of Jay's interest. One example, United Airlines is one of the biggest employers in the world. Mm -hmm. They're not alone, but they're unique in that they have a footprint in over 70 countries, meaning they have employees in so many. It's very rare, mm -hmm. right? It's very rare to find that type of footprint. Global airlines are special in that case for obvious reasons. But what I find interesting is that if you think about the romantic era of air travel, think back to Pan Am, black and white photos, people wearing suits and ties, mm -hmm. drinking champagne. It was a real luxury. And where we have devolved today where you see scenes of chaos on board <laughs> as people are fighting and getting dragged off. <laughs> what happened here? You had costs that came down, but you also had an experience that went from aspirational and high end to something considerably less. We don't have the same level of trust in those providers. I give you the United Airlines example because they have enormous reach. Why is it that United's value proposition is to take J from point A to point B? That's it. Mm. You don't talk to me about United Airlines, but when you're going from Newark to Canada, and yet they have massive relationships with credit card providers, mm -hmm. sports teams who they carry, hotel brands for which their employees stay all over mm -hmm. the globe. Mm -hmm. So many city-specific arrangements and venues, not just in the transportation space. Isn't there an opportunity for United to actually be an experience provider, not just an air travel provider? They've looked at it through a very narrow lens. We need to do this part well. Let's get Jay from A to B. And they have, over time, started to provide some ancillary benefits through their loyalty programs. Right. And those have been hugely successful. American Express has been a leader in it. Airlines have been huge players in it. They are moving quarterly earnings. That's how powerful these loyalty programs are. And more recently, we're hearing about programs like Starbucks, mm -hmm. which has over 30 million loyalty members. I'm not a coffee drinker, so it's less applicable to me. But for those that are loyal to Starbucks, they swear by the Starbucks app. And it's only about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. Incredible adoption. And the more pertinent point is that Starbucks has enjoyed enormous free float. Come back to Uncle Warren mm -hmm. because Jay prepays on that Starbucks app. He loads it up with $20 at a time or $50 at a time so that when he orders his Frappuccino, he can seamlessly pay one click through the app. It's produced. It's ready. It's got his name on it waiting for him at checkout when he walks into that location. And at one back one point eight billion in cash they have in their app big right number. through their app. That's a pretty big, big number, number. <sighs> which they sit on. That's prepayment, yeah. a portion of which is used and a portion of which, just like gift cards and other rewards mm -hmm. cards, goes unused. It ends up being free money. So that's been an, an enormous boon to Starbucks. They have maximized it beautifully and they are now leading the charge in incorporating Web3 technology in the form of smart contracts. Mm -hmm. the form of NFTs, into that very program. You could do all the searching you want. You will not hear them talk about NFTs as no. part of the program. They don't have to. When you and I talk about music, we talk about the experience. We talk about listening to the Beatles. We don't talk about the MP3 mm -hmm. that's delivering that music to our ears. Mm -hmm. And so the same is true in our space. Because it's so early, because it's so nascent, a lot of the focus has been around the technology rather than the experience. Mm. We hope that 2023 is the year where that begins to shift. My brother doesn't care about the technology. He doesn't care 
how Google is actually storing his data. Mm -hmm. He just wants to know that it is happening seamlessly. Yeah. And then and the this, next time he goes to search, he gets better results because they know him and they understand him and he gets customization and it solves his problem. He gets convenience, accessibility, easier, cheaper, doesn't have to pay for it. As you said, there's a great burden involved that maybe more of us are missing it than I would like to my naive well, look, eyes and to believe. Great. AI is all the rage. It's all yeah. we can hear talk about. There's recently been congressional hearings about how to think about and, and police and regulate AI. No one's really diving into the machine learning systems that undergird mm. something like ChatGBT4. We just know it's Google on steroids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you prompt it. And the more information you prompt it with, it's going to give you extraordinary output. For most people... That's great. I just want to go on living my life and hope that you're going to make it easier for me, make me more efficient than I used to be. So I want to come back to your point around ambassadorship and retention. How does Web3 enable that more? I mean, when I think about ambassadorship, ownership makes a difference. If I own a digital asset, if I feel owner of a community, then I am more likely to be an ambassador. In your case, for big words, you were paid or compensated in some way, perhaps the new community you don't need to compensate. Is is that one of the reasons why Web3 enables more ambassadors, more retention, or is there something else? I always think that incentives matter. Incentives drive mm -hmm. behavior. If Jay currently leases a car, and let's say it's a fancy car, it's a German luxury car, and that lease is set to expire at the end of this month, would competitor automobile manufacturers want to know mm -hmm. that Jay is coming off lease. You better believe it. They want to uh -huh. know how much are they willing to pay Jay for that information? How much are they willing to see a digital copy of that mm -hmm. auto lease that confirms, hmm, he's going to be shit out of luck in two weeks. Right. He's been paying this month monthly. He's trustworthy. He's committed to this car. He's going to need another one. Right. We know what he likes. He likes the smell of that fine leather. Mm -hmm. Do we have a product that we can put in front of him? Can we incentivize him to come to our dealership? Not only by potentially paying him to confirm that he is, in fact, an eligible bachelor, mm -hmm. but offering him some loyalty pay. But, you know, most of the manufacturers today, they offer you a loyalty benefit or some other cash incentive if you shift right. from one brand to the other, all right? If you've owned a Japanese car and now you're going to buy an American car, they'll give you $500 for switching. But usually people only find out about that when they're at the dealership already mm -hmm. and only if the dealer asks them and prompts them with the right questions. More of that information is now available online as consumers are getting smarter. They're saying, well, I can go to this dealership and demand mm -hmm. that loyalty Track. But what you're touching on is an initiative that we at Metaversal have now been working on largely in stealth mode and has a lot to do with personal achievement. Mm -hmm. All of us as individuals have achievements that we have accomplished and we are thinking about achievement. We define achievement based on Jay's time, skill, and energy, right? That those are components that allow you to power through. It could be power through for some academic achievement. It could be some professional certification. You become a doctor or an engineer. It could be sports related. You were able to complete a marathon or climb to the top of a big mountain. Those are all individual achievements. We're not talking about attendance. You didn't just show up at a concert. It actually is something that's hard to do. That's the skill part. Not everyone has completed a marathon. It's not easy to travel 26 miles by foot. No, it's not and good what happens, <laughs> Huh? It, it may not be great. Yeah. What happens when you cross that finish line? Let's use you in this example. You cross that finish line in the Big Apple. It ends in Central Park. They wrap this foil blanket and they give you a physical medal. Mm -hmm. And you make your way home, you hobble home, you high five your friends and family, and that metal typically goes somewhere in a drawer, in a closet, not to be seen again. You might post about it on social media, okay? 
But you rarely wear that medal out to dinner. No, never. You rarely bring that to the office and try to get excitement uh, out of your colleagues. They're proud of you. They may yeah. be happy for your achievement, but it's not something that you regularly advertise. And yet, there's a lot of brands that would love to know Jay crossed that finish line. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine that there was a digital version of your physical medal. And you'd say, well, that just seems simple and stupid, Dan. There's nothing to that. But that'd be missing the point. We're not just talking about creating a digital twin so that you have something to show off on a social media page. I'm talking to you about what is the utility in knowing that Jay was able to successfully complete that marathon? Would a life insurer be interested to know that Jay had the capacity to run 26 miles? You better believe it. Would a health insurer want to know that? For sure. Mm -hmm. Would certain types of running shoe manufacturers, think of Brooks running, think of New Balance, mm -hmm. not just Nike. These are mm -hmm. not casual walking shoes. He needs a specific type of runner to go that distance. So too for his gear. Maybe there are companies that cater to someone who is going to need to recover. He's going to need those massaging machines, right? Well, Hypervolt, which are now all the rage. Maybe a hotel or spa is going to invite him to use their facilities during the day because all of those hospitality facilities post-COVID have been rethinking how they make use of mm -hmm. their spaces in Monday through Thursday. Mm -hmm. Common areas, conference rooms, even a penthouse. Not for Jay to stay in, for Jay to have a business dinner in. Mm -hmm. The penthouse is unused most nights of the month. Because they know that I just completed my university degree or I just got this new job, some achievement that they know that I have, which aligns with their persona that they believe would fill their, would buy their product or buy their service. So to me, that is micro-targeting. Rather than mass marketing, hitting Dan left, right, and center with just do it advertisements. Yeah, guys, I know Nike. I, I it. hear it. I get it. I like your tennis shorts. That's about all I wear. They wouldn't know that, Jay. They wouldn't no. know that years ago, I used to play a lot of tennis. And if I played tennis at a certain level in my youth, there's a good chance I still play tennis today. And that would be true. I achieved certain things when it came to tennis. That's not on Google. It's not on LinkedIn. It's not something we readily advertise because it's both personal and a bit dated. Mm -hmm. We don't put everything that we accomplish on there. But think about the ability for us to own those achievements mm -hmm. in an easy to share format. Doesn't mean you have to. It means mm -hmm. Jay now has the luxury of choosing. Mm -hmm. I have these digital items. Consider them to be medallions. And I have the choice of whether to reveal that they're associated with me. Does cool. that unlock rewards and incentives and benefits and other experiences? Does it unlock new social interactions with people that also finished that same marathon? How many of the 30,000 yeah. marathon racers in New York did you get to speak to? As you're <laughs> running the 26 miles, let me venture a guess. Very few. You're huffing and puffing. You don't want to talk to anybody. But how many would I want to speak to? You're in a unique club. Probably got, all of them, got, right? All managed to finish it. Yeah. And what about the people that help you accomplish that achievement? Mm. Your spouse, your partner who is training with you, right? Your spouse because... She lets you have five hours every other day to go and train and race and stretch and do all the things you need to. Your training partner for giving you the mental fortitude to not quit after the 12th mile, to keep going. So the ability to acknowledge and pay it forward to friends, family, and others who are often instrumental in making those achievements come to life. Mm. We very rarely get to the top of a mountain alone. Mm -hmm. Where does all of this go from a 
a standpoint of right now, when we have take some sort of action transaction on the Ethereum blockchain, anybody can look it up. It's on Etherscan. Sure, Etherscan is not the easiest platform to use unless you're a tech nerd and understand how to dissect that data, but it's available. There's zero, lots of zero knowledge proofs being worked on and coming online into mainnet. Is this all going to be data and this could be your proof of achievement related or it could be something else that's going to be private to us and we're going to open it up to those who we want to share it with? Or does it continue to all be public and it's just all on chain and available for anybody to look up and any brand can go and see it? How do you see that playing out? So I envision a world where all of this information is on chain. It is all right. on public ledger. The key is whether it is associated with Jay definitively mm -hmm. or not. Jay will know what is his. The question is, I may not know it's Jay's. And I need mechanisms to associate that information with him. Today, we use a phone number, an email address, and that's usually the big unlock. When you go to a pharmacy like CVS, what do you type in at checkout? A phone number. Phone number. No one remembers a 14-digit CVS loyalty number. <laughs> you put in a phone number, it calculates a little discount, and next thing you know, there's an eight-foot-long receipt that they give me for my loyalty, right? That's their way of saying, hey, Dan, come back and buy more cosmetic products you may not need. I envision this future where all of this data that's associated with Jay is verifiable. That's what it means for us to put it on a blockchain that is a public ledger. It's trustless. I don't need to go and ask the registrar's office of some university if Jay graduated because he says he did. I could look it up as long as Jay gives me the clue of where to find it. I need that association. So I envision that people will have a private digital wallet, which they may not share mm -hmm. with others, and they'll have a public facing digital wallet, which they are opting to share. And they're doing so with the knowledge that things should benefit them in terms of access, in terms of rewards, in terms of experiences, incentives, because they're providing a patchwork of their digital persona. And that ties to their physical interests and their physical habits. And in that way, it begins to unlock the holy grail of, well, what is Jay really excited about? What is he excited about? What are his habits? Anytime you have to try and change adult behavior, I think that's dangerous. What excites me here is that, yes, there are challenges with the clunkiness of the technology, that is already being That will be solved. Yeah. There are tens of thousands of developers coming from the best and biggest companies streaming into our space. I have zero concern that we're going to get super seamless, one-click access for all of these issues. It just doesn't all exist today on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So then how do we meet the consumer where they are without necessitating that they change everything that they do. I'd rather they not change a lot of what they do. And uh, as time progresses, they see the benefit. My parents the other day sent their first payment via Zelle. Okay. Massive well, innovation, okay? Because <laughs> they like writing checks. I'm always scratching my head. Who is still yeah. writing physical checks and mailing them? What a process. Now I know. But they successfully sent a first payment via Zelle and thought it was the greatest thing since oh, sliced yeah. bread. Welcome. Welcome to the 21st century. So that's still largely web two. Yeah. And these are the same folks that would stick to a flip phone, except they understood the power of an iPhone, of a smartphone. I was a traditionalist in that even in my time in Washington, we were all given Blackberries. I love the Blackberry. A little keyboard, your thumbs were so happy. And so when the iPhone was first introduced, I watched Steve Jobs on stage. Like, what a gimmick. Yeah. What would you need that for? What am I going to do with all those other apps? It's just a distraction. Then you fast forward a few years and I became obsessed mm -hmm. with all the ways that I could 
use the iPhone and it continues to improve, mm -hmm. right? You don't need measuring devices. Your iPhone has a built-in measuring device for rooms, not That's just incredible. a piece of paper. I've been using that while I've been renovating recently. <laughs> so it doesn't necessarily replace the tape measure. Most carpenters still have a physical tape measure, but it is seamless and easy for Jay, who isn't a carpenter and doesn't carry it around in the normal course, just like I don't carry around my external hard drive. These all become unlocks. Well, it makes me think about how right now when Apple privacy policy changed and all of a sudden apps had to request to have access to your data to track your actions through their app. All the apps ask and they they use the language of will you allow us to improve your experience, right? Because that's the the no. mindset that they're taking, right? No. So everybody everyone's saying no and yeah, very simple. But that same lens of improving experience is really what consumer data on chain will do is it will allow us to have an improved experience, not because we're going to be advertised to though. I mean, I guess that could be part of it, but there's so much more that could be done with our data in terms of giving us access to communities, giving us access to events, providing us with opportunities that we had never had before. We all want to be part of a community. And I think it all comes back to community. And you mentioned that at the beginning being such a core aspect of the blockchain experience and web three is really going to unlock that for the first time. And we've all desired that for so long. So this proof of achievement that you're talking about, it's very exciting to think about where we are 10 years from now when we're all on chain and we all have on chain purchases and data. That's what I really get excited. Which you no. control, which yeah. you get to decide what you do with it. There's also a philosophical piece here that excites me when you talk about community, because I think it goes to a much broader issue. We have a deficit of happiness, mm -hmm. not only in the United States, but around the world. And the science around happiness has become very, very popular. If you look at the number one course at Harvard and the number one course at Yale, you'll find both have to do with the science of happiness. Really? Perennially sold out thousands of people trying to jam into these courses. And the science around happiness in human beings is very complex. A big chunk of it is genetic, which means we can't control it. But there are portions that you can control. And study after study shows that the common thread is not just family and faith. It's never about money and material things. Hopefully, People remember the refrain, money doesn't buy happiness, and yet they still yearn for it. Money can buy them more time. It can buy them access. It doesn't necessarily buy happiness, but human beings derive happiness from social interaction, from being part and parcel of community. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the prehistoric age, you had small tribes. Those were small cohorts of individuals they were helping one another. They were responsible for one another. When we talk about the arc of decentralization, back then, prehistoric times, we were definitely decentralized. There was no government du monde. There was no state authority. These were nomads, and they got along as best they could. As society progressed, you had more and more centralization taking shape, providing law and order, but also beginning to influence what happens to your particular personal property, your rights, your sense of ownership. And the historical arc now is on the cusp of this decentralized wave, which fits into the natural course of historical evolution. But my point is, it shouldn't surprise us that as society has become more sophisticated, that we're more aware of ways in which we can function and operate independently with greater ownership of a lot of what we do, rather than relying on a centralized institution, be it financial, be it regulatory, to dictate all that we do. It doesn't mean we're a vote for lawlessness. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't mean that anyone is voting for hackers and criminal misdeeds, but it gives the opportunity for Jay to finally take back control like he used to have before technology was so pervasive. And so when we look at all the benefits that technology has brought to us, right, you always wonder, how did I meet you at the movies in the 1980s? How did we coordinate to see Top Gun yeah. in the theater? What if you were running late? What if you couldn't find the bus? And today we just take it for granted. Certainly our kids' generation, I mean, they're planning every move on their devices. And yet we're, we know the concerns. We know the ills from a lot of these apps because especially for young women, there's no happiness at the end of the Instagram or TikTok room. No. Okay. No. It has substantial effects and feel like each month you're reading about the next warning. And so I see the power of building these communities as a form of bringing and restoring some of that happiness quotient to your life. Because inevitably, if you want to stay a very private individual, no one's going to force you to get out of your apartment or your house. But you're only going to have that true sense of fulfillment when you venture out to meet folks for dinner, when you venture out to that conference like I'm going to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then part of the purpose is learning and exposing yourself to new ideas and also interacting with others. That brings well, us the greatest sense of fulfillment and happiness. I, yeah, I, I think what came up for me when you brought up the pursuit of happiness and the number of people that are trying to achieve that and how difficult that has become is this feeling of isolation. And I think it's in the UK that they have a director or a, a governor of isolation who is focused on reducing isolation. And I think America as well has recognized, many countries around the world have recognized that isolation is a leading cause of mental health issues. And what is isolation the opposite of? It's the opposite of community. And it is hard to build community. It's hard to find like-minded people, particularly if you live in a small town or if you live in a country that views things differently than you. But now with the digital age, all of a sudden we could connect with like-minded people online, but we were we so far had been doing so only in a way where we had to go out and find it. Whereas what could happen in the future is when we have our data on chain, it's possible that we could be brought into communities as a result of our achievements, of our actions, of our POAPs, the, the events that we attend, all of a sudden it can be brought to us by brands or by companies or by events because they can create those experiences and create community and yeah, possibly shared experience. experience. And it's super, it's super national, yeah. right? It's not just limited to my geographic region. If I were a major Moonbirds holder, I wouldn't easily find you, Jay. You don't live in geographic proximity mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And yet we would share certain interests in common. All of a sudden, there's an opportunity for us to not only form relationships. And it's not simply, hey, let's start hanging out with strangers. That's not the message. The message is that we have shared interests that transcend borders. Mm -hmm. And we can begin expanding those horizons because what's the benefit when people travel? What do they come back and love? New experience, new learning, new interactions with people, new observations of how other cultures and societies operate. Those are all things that inspire. They not only educate. So to me, this is part and parcel of that which we already know and accept. We're just now mm -hmm. finding ways to document it, to inscribe it. I don't remember all the achievements that I've had. I don't remember all the trips in detail that we've mm -hmm. been on. And yet having a catalog, even if it remains private, that I can easily pass down, you know, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you up at night is trying to remember where all the photos are that you have from the last 20 years. Yeah. Because they're not all on Google Drive. Some may still be on that external hard drive. Some are physical copies. You want to hand that to the next generation? There's going to be easier ways.
and we're on the cusp of it. And that's what makes us super excited about everything that we see. And it comes back to evolving culture mm -hmm. because top part and parcel of what brings us happiness is our cultural interests. Just like we're all collectors, we all have some cultural interest. They can be incredibly diverse. That's what makes it exciting. And finding individuals that share some of those cultural interests, that has always been the driving force of society mm -hmm. going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So part of our mission at Metaversal is really around acquisition and production of Web3 native intellectual property. And that positions us right on the leading edge of culture. We're seeing new projects and new communities forming around those projects that are incredibly inspiring. Does it mean that every one of them is going to stand the test of time? You know the answer. Don't wait for the buzzer. 98 or 99 percent of the NFT projects that have come out will have a terminal value of zero. I'm far from the first to say it. Does it mean you can't participate and enjoy that particular NFT project, we're talking about lasting value. We're talking mm -hmm. about franchises. We're talking about media companies. There have been lots of efforts to build the next Disney. Few have managed to do it. And yet we know that the next great media and entertainment businesses will be born out of this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're very focused on participating in it finding ways to be supportive of it and ultimately of the underlying creators. And this will be the last tangible example because you asked a series of questions and we've touched on, I think, most of the answers. The last tangible example is why this is so beneficial for the individual creators. You think about Taylor Swift, who's been having this massive tour through parts of the U.S. right now. Those are not easy tickets to get. Mm -hmm. They may have a face value of $100, but you'll be hard-pressed to pay 100 bucks and walk in that stadium. Why? Brokers, resellers, StubHub. You may have to pay $1,000 to get that ticket. Now, let's think about that transaction. It's an e-ticket, so we're already in the electronic digital sphere. The face value is 100 bucks, which means Taylor gets some contractually specified percentage of the 100 Jay decides he's not going to the concert. Maybe he never was. He was just a speculator. He decides to go and sell that ticket today to me. I want to go to the concert or my wife wants to go to the concert. I'm going to buy the ticket, but I'm not paying the face value anymore. Jay has marked it up. 10X. It's now $1,000. Pretty expensive. Really better like her music. Can I be certain that that ticket is valid? We hear plenty of examples where people walk up to Madison Square Garden, they have a QR code that they think is their electronic ticket, and they get the beep boop. Like, what's that sound? That's never a good sound. This ticket is not valid, right? The guy's scanning it, beep boop, not going to let you in. I'm sorry. But what do you mean? I paid $1,000 for the ticket. I want to go and see Taylor Swift. Nothing we can do. Fake ticket. Sorry. So seamless verification. If that ticket were on chain, trustless. Immediately, that issue goes away. We know it can be verified instantaneously. And like you say, it's not going to happen through some of the available search engines right now that are online. It's going to be new protocols and new mechanisms to bring that data so that Jay has the confidence to say, hey, this ticket's legit. Let's do it. But we haven't solved the other part of the equation, which is this is a very expensive resale. And Taylor Swift is the one that's on stage singing two plus hours. Has she earned another dollar? As a result of that resale, not in the current system, she doesn't earn a shiny penny more. But if you take that same process that we described and embed a smart contract into that ticket, smart contract isn't so fancy. It simply has a series of if then statements. If Jay sells it to someone else for a price above the face value, a royalty will redound to the benefit of the creator. You tell me what the right royalty is. Could be 10%, could be 50% after she's mm -hmm. the one singing. Maybe mm -hmm. it should be 80%. Cut down on some of the aftermarket nonsense. And all of a sudden, it's dramatically changing the economics for her as the one who is really putting on the show. Doesn't that make intuitive sense? The same is true in the art market. Andy Warhol never sold a piece for north of $100 million in his lifetime mm -hmm. and his estate 
hasn't been the beneficiary of resale royalties by and large. Same is true with automobile manufacturers. My last example, Jay wants to go and buy, we talked about luxury automobiles for a bit before. Mm -hmm. Jay wants to go and buy that new electric Humvee. General Motors said, we're going to put out a super duper Hummer, enormous horsepower. Jay decides he needs one of those. 100,000 people went into a dealership and said, hey, love that concept. I want that car. Here's $500 refundable deposit. Refundable deposit. $500, 100,000 people, $50 million sitting in escrow, waiting for them to manufacture the car. What have we achieved? It's really just consumer preference. It's reservations. You're taking a sequencing. J is number 1,000. I go to the dealer late. I'm number 48,000. J comes home. It's like, you know, I'm not sure I need this car so soon. It's not going to fit in the garage. Maybe eventually I'm going to want it. Not sure I want to be the first batch could have some issues that need to work out. He doesn't have a mechanism to go into a dynamic marketplace today and sell his spot. He can't find me, nor can I find him because I go home and my spouse says, love that thing. How soon are we getting it? Ooh, Mm -hmm. we're pretty far down on the list, sweetheart. That could be months from now, may not even be this year. You know, she's not going to be happy when Mm -hmm. she looks back at you. Is there something I can do to advance on that list? Not today. But if we take that same transaction, it's a reservation that Jay holds and embed a smart contract that says, look, you can take this. You can potentially transact on it. You can go into a marketplace and find Dan. No one's forcing you. You're willing to wait. Dan wants to expedite his delivery date. You guys can transact. just like the NFL draft. I'm going to bump mm-hmm. up and take a first round pick. I'm going to give you three of my third round picks. It happens all every year. But now there's an exchange of value. And so that I may have to pay you some additional compensation to get your special slot. Shouldn't the manufacturer participate in that transaction? Well, now they can for the same reason we gave in the ticketing example. And is the consumer better off? Well, you're certainly no worse off. We have arranged consumer preferences according to your interest, and your willingness to pay. No one's forcing you to go to the dealer in the first place. No one's forcing you to move up in position. The manufacturer benefits because that $500 refundable deposit turns into a $500 non-refundable deposit to start. They have sold it to you. Do as you wish. You can show up and collect your car as scheduled. You can sell it to someone else and they will participate. Maybe they take 50% of a subsequent resale. I pay you another $500 to get your slot. Maybe General Motors takes 250 of that. Think about all the value creation that could happen. And all we've done is align the ordering of when people get those cars. They haven't Mm -hmm. even built the vehicle yet. It makes me think about Ledger Stacks, which was sold all on pre-sale. They sold out I mean, obviously they set a quantity that they were willing to sell and pre-sale. And if you missed out on that pre-sale, still right now, if you wanted to, you could go because you can't buy a Ledger Stacks in the like direct line store. Ledger currently. Yeah. So you could go and you could go to a secondary marketplace. You could buy the NFT that gives you access to burn it to claim a Ledger Stacks and boom you got to ledge your stacks and you wouldn't be able to do that previously. And as you said, there wouldn't be a marketplace for it. It's amazing, Dan, to hear your mind and get excited about all these real consumer use cases, which I'll bet your brother will even be excited about. (laughs) Okay. I want to wrap up with a speed round, but before we do, Dan, where can people follow you? Where can they find you online? Anything you want to tell people about Metaversal? The floor is yours for a little bit of a shill. At Hello Metaversal is the place to find our company, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn. At Dan Schmarin is my Twitter address. And you can look up Dan Schmarin on LinkedIn. You'll find me there as well. Folks find themselves in South Florida. Feel free to send us a note. Stop by Metaversal HQ. We have a growing presence in lots of other places now because... We have team members that span the globe from Africa and Europe all the way to Canada and the U.S. So 
if you can't find us in one of our workplaces, you'll probably find us at a leading conference. So don't be a stranger. Awesome. Okay. A couple of quick speed round questions and then we'll wrap up. First one, what's an NFT you'll never sell? You know, when I started Metaversal with my business partner, Yossi, we're having a good time one day and bought some NFTs together called Maison du Goat. Maison du Goat is definitely in the 99% that will have terminal value of zilch, but it is a memento to the early days, the early struggle as we were putting together our manifesto for Metaversal. So that that's a puppy I'll never touch. Awesome. Okay. One thing you bought recently for under $100 that brings you joy does not have to be a digital product. The thing that has brought me great joy is a expandable folder because okay. I believe in organized mind and organized desk. And when I travel now, it brings me happiness to flip through the different folders and see different items and different. It's the small stuff, Jay. Yeah, I was going to say, as a fan of David Allen and getting things done, I love organization. So you're, you're speaking to me for sure on that one. Okay, last question. If you had a billboard that one billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? Be kind. It goes to the heart and it goes to happiness. Mm -hmm. Our brains are wired to take us down really negative paths. Mm -hmm. It's that fight or flight instinct. It's built into all of us. And no amount of therapy is going to undo that wiring. The best thing we could do is be kind. It doesn't cost us anything. Pay someone a compliment. Open the door. Give up a seat on an airplane. I know that's a touchy issue for a lot of people <laughs> when you are traveling alone and you see the mom with the kids and they are yeah. all separated. Be the person that goes up and says, how can I help? Because karma is a boomerang. I love it. Dan, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks for all you're doing for this space. And I hope to uh, meet you in the metaverse sometime in the future. Thank you. Great to be with you. Talk soon. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.